So apparently it's snowing. That's what the little dots are around in the screen. And it's cold. And two of the kids are walking by and they're all bundled up with fur caps and heavy coats and their hands in their pockets. And one of them says, Snoopy looks kind of cold, doesn't he? And Snoopy's sitting there shivering. The other boy or girl, whichever it is, says, I'll say he does. <clears throat> Maybe we'd better go over and comfort him. So they go over to him and says, be of good cheer, Snoopy. The other one says, yes, be of good cheer. And they walk off, leaving Snoopy there, uh, wondering what's going on. And he's still shivering and still cold. And it's kind of an illustration of down below the line there. James 2, 15 through 16. Let's read that. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Well, the answer is, of course, it doesn't profit anything at all. In the bottom right-hand corner is just a, a comment, a reference. Let's read that. When the spies at Jericho were discovered, they needed more than words of comfort from Rahab. Rahab helped deliver them to safety in a very clever way. God later describes the actions of Rahab as works done by faith and says her works made her righteous. Page one, the works of righteousness of Rahab. Now, earlier, George read Joshua 2, 1 through 12. And this is just a little summary of that. Let's read it together. Joshua sent two men to spy out Jericho. You don't need the one that says the cartoon. So this one says the works of righteousness of Rahab, a summary. Let's read that. Joshua sent two men to spy out Jericho. They came to the house of Rahab the harlot. Word came to the king of Jericho that spies were in her house. <clears throat> he sent word to Rahab to bring the men out. She hid the two spies and said they had left already. She suggested that the men of the city immediately go out and catch them. The king's men went all the way to the Jordan without finding them, then returned. Rahab told the spies everyone had heard the Jewish people had crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and about the victories Jehovah had given them afterward. The people of Jericho were terrified of the Jews and of Jehovah, the Jewish God. Now, we're going to pause there for a second. The people of Jericho were the people of that land that God had promised to the Jews. Back in the time of Abraham, he had said, I'm giving them 400 years. In 400 years, they won't straighten themselves out. 
So he gave these people 400 years to straighten out from their sin and idolatry, and they didn't do a thing about it. So now God is bringing his people to extract the vengeance of God against the wicked people of the land. And it's a reminder of how terrible the vengeance of God is. On the other hand, it's an example of how stubborn sin can be in people because these people didn't do anything about their sin in 400 years and now they think they're going to fight the very God that they're absolutely terrified of. So then, we don't have the text here. But on the rest of this page is a summary of Joshua chapter 2, verses 13 through 21. Let's read that. Rahab asked for the spies to see to it that she and her family would be saved when the Jews attacked Jericho. She told them to hide three days and then to go back to the Jewish people. She asked them to swear to the bargain. They agreed, but said that she would have to have her family together at her place and hang the scarlet cord out the window when the attack came. Because the way she let them go was down a scarlet cord out her window. And they said, put that same cord out the window and we'll know to save everybody in that house. Now, the last thing that George had read is she said, give me a token. There's all kinds of stories about this token. The most elaborate one I know is that one of the men had a bracelet or an ornament or something with a some kind of medallion on it that identified him as Jewish and of the tribe that he was from and that he took it and gave it to her and Rahab put it on a necklace and wore it. Well, I mean, it could have happened. We don't know what the token was or if the token just referred to the agreement about the scarlet cord hanging out the window. Who was Rahab? The harlot. Rahab the harlot, a resident of Jericho who saves the men by letting them down out the window on the scarlet cord. Page two. Now the story goes over to chapter 6 in Joshua. So we're leaving out chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5, and lots of things happen there. But this is about Jericho. So in chapter 6 of Joshua, this is a summary of the first four, uh, 14 verses. Let's read that. Jehovah told Joshua to have the people march around Jericho. The armed men went first, followed by seven priests with trumpets, then by priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. The people were to follow completely silent. They did this once a day for six days. Now, here's a people that are absolutely terrified of the Jews, probably expecting an attack or something. And here they come with their armed men and priests blowing with trumpets, whether they were blowing them with, with trumpets, priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and then a whole crowd of people that just walk silently around the city and leave. 
And every day for six days they do this. One time a day. Then, starting in verse 15, is God's judgment on Jericho. And George is going to read this for us. Do what? I, I think that's what we usually do, yeah. Joshua chapter 6, verses 15 through 21. Let's begin. And it came to pass on the seventh day that Israel rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city as they had done the first six days. But on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. And it came to pass on the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for Jehovah has given you the city. The silver and gold and precious metal was devoted unto Jehovah. And the city's wealth shall be devoted to Jehovah, even all that is therein. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. But as you, you only keep yourselves from the devoted things. Lest when you have devoted them, you take of them that would make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. All the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are holy unto Jehovah. They shall come into the treasury of Jehovah. The walls of Jericho fall down, fell down. So the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass, when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, that the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the Jews went in, into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, both young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. <clears throat> it would not have been a good thing that day to be a resident of Jericho and not a close relative of Rahab the harlot. <clears throat> but it's a reminder that God intended to carry out his vengeance against these people completely. It also stands as a statement about what happened at Ai, where the man went in and took some of the stuff for himself and brought damage and death on Israel needlessly. Here the instructions were absolutely clear. There's not anything in that city that goes as spoils to the people. It's said that when they dug down through the ruins of Jericho and came to the level where they think Jericho was at this time, that where the granary was, where they stored grain, that that was broken down and the residue of grain was there burned to ashes underneath the stones. And they, they analyzed it and found out it was a grain that they would eat. 
And normally that kind of thing the enemy would take as a, a spoil to feed themselves. But it says they utterly destroyed everything in that city except the metals. And they were for God. Metals, gold, silver, oh, okay. iron, uh, any kind of metal. So on page three, Rahab and her people were saved. Joshua six. 22 through 25. Let's read that. And Joshua said unto the two men that had spied out the land, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she has as you swore unto her. And the young men, the spies, went in and brought out Rahab and her people, and they set them safely outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and all that was therein. Okay, I'm... Uh, I'm sorry, the text goes on to page four there. But the precious metals they put into the treasury of the house of Jehovah. But Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all that she had did Jericho, um, did Joshua save alive. And Rahab dwelt in the midst of Israel unto this day. Because she hid the mission. Spy out Jericho. Because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. The Bible is absolutely clear why Rahab and her family were saved. Because she hid the messengers. Now, there's not anything in here, New Testament or Old Testament, that approves of the lie that she told, saying they already left. And you could say, well, what if she hadn't lied? I think God still would have, through his providence, allowed the... The, the spies to be saved by her plan and things would have worked out. On the other hand, it doesn't much bother me that in a situation like that, she wasn't honest with a king. You know, everybody has different opinions about that if they care. The Bible just doesn't discuss that. But what blessed her was that she hid the messengers and then we're going to read in the New Testament and she got the messengers away. She saved the messengers. She did the right thing. So when we think about this story of Rahab's involvement with the destruction of Jericho, Number one, Rahab believed in God and she wasn't destroyed with the disobedient. We know she believed in God because it's in the text. The text said, Jehovah is the great God. He rules in heaven and earth. She had sense enough to know that standing against God, she wouldn't have a chance in the world. Had she studied the scriptures? 
no, we don't have any idea how she came to this. The Bible simply doesn't say. It could have been just because of the things she heard. We don't know any of that. But we do know she believed in God because it says so. And we're going to get to that scripture in just a minute. Hebrews 11.21. Did we read that or not? Let's read it again. By faith. Rahab the harlot was not destroyed with those who were disobedient. By faith. Whose faith? Her faith. Her faith. That's how we know from the New Testament. It's, uh, she had faith. It's silly to think it's not talking about faith in God because everything else in Hebrews is talking about faith in God. In the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses, the faith of Moses' parents in saving him. She acted the only way she knew how on her faith. Put yourself in her position. If you had been there, and you understood what was going to happen to Jericho. And you believed in God. Would you betray the spies to the king of the city? You know? What, what, you know, that's not what you do by faith. But by faith... She did something. She was a very, I think, clever woman. Her plan showed a lot of ability to think under pressure. Uh, you know, she sent them out chasing after nothing, hid the spies, Afterwards, she let them down the wall so they could escape. Because after three days, I guess they figured, well, they, they'd gone back over to their people or whatever. We couldn't find them. Then it was safe for them to go on back to the Hebrew people. Yeah, she took chances. She was very courageous. But the alternative was just to say to the king, yeah, they're up on my roof. You know? And that wasn't going to work out. Number two, the Bible says her works made her righteous. Her works made her righteous. James 2.25 Rahab the harlot was made righteous from works, having received the agents and having sent them out safely another way. She did two things. She received the agents and she sent them out another way. Yeah, but what I'm saying is this is the Bible stamp. It makes it absolutely clear that in doing those two things, She was made righteous from works. The, the, the point is, where does that leave people who say that what you do has nothing to do with your salvation? 
it leads in nowhere. Here's an absolute case where a woman, a heathen woman of ill repute, you could say, maybe she wasn't in her town, but by our way of looking at it, yeah, was made righteous from her works. And we know back in Hebrews 11, 1, it was by faith. Works by faith made her righteous. We don't know. Who what? Who did what? They didn't have time to teach her to receive them. We don't know that. It's simply not stated anywhere. That's part of the story we don't know. You could make up your own story. And people do. Oh my goodness, they make up their stories. I heard a sermon not long ago. You wouldn't have thought it was the same story. It was so full of could have been this and could have been that and could have been this and then maybe they said this and maybe they knew that and maybe she... You know, it doesn't say. Strictly from the Bible, we know that Rahab had faith and it kept her from being destroyed with the other people of Jericho. And we know that Rahab was made righteous from her works. Number three, Rahab was an ancestor of King David and of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 1, the first gospel in the New Testament begins by saying the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And then verses 5 and 6, as it's telling about these generations, it says, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. So in the ancestry of Christ is Rahab the harlot, and Ruth the Moabite woman. You say, well, we can't choose our ancestors. Well, We wonder, would Rahab have been in that ancestry if she had been minded like the other people in Jericho? She would have perished with them. If, however she came by it, she didn't have faith. And if she didn't work by faith to do what she could in that circumstance, in that time, in her place to help the spies, to help God's people, she would have died with the other people in Jericho. Chances are her name wouldn't even bother to be in the Bible. You could look at it and say, well, God, yeah, well, God can do anything. I, I get that. But the Bible doesn't say that Rahab the harlot was moved like a puppet by God who pulled her strings and her made her do these things. It says she did what she did by faith. 
And it says that what she did made her righteous. And so before we end, I didn't have room for it here, it's just a thought. It's always right to do the right thing. And I think it's always right to try to get other people to do the right thing or to point out what the right thing to do is. Sometimes people don't know what the right thing to do is. But if a person will start doing the right thing, they might find out they like it. Chances are we like doing the right thing well enough. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean it makes us feel like we've got all the money we want or all the privilege or power or influence. It doesn't say Rahab got rich. It doesn't say her husband was the most important person in Israel. But here she is, named amongst God's people, who was once in her life known as Rahab the harlot. Yeah, and in the lineage of Christ. We never know the minds and hearts of those that are with us. We're going to sing number 62. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, we ask that you make your needs known while we stand and sing. Number 62, bring Christ to your broken life. Bring Christ your broken life, so marred by sin, He will create anew, make whole again your empty, wasted years. He will restore. And your iniquities remember no more. Bring him your every care, if great or small, whatever troubles you. Oh, bring it all. Bring him the haunting fears, the nameless dread. Thy heart he will relieve and lift up thy head. Bring him your weariness, receive his rest. Weep out your blinding tears upon his breast. His love is wonderful. His power is great, and none that trust in Him shall be desolate. Blessed Savior of us all, Almighty Friend, his presence shall be ours unto the end. Without him life would be how dark, how drear. 
But with him morning breaks, and heaven is near. In the front of our books is the Lord's Prayer. Let's read that together, then we'll ask George to lead us in a closing prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdoms come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, again, we thank you for this day and for allowing us to gather in your house of worship to sing you songs of praise and worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, dear Lord, for allowing Brother Ed to be with us again this day to bring us your message <clears throat> and, for, and to guide us in teaching the understanding of your word. We pray, dear Lord, that you will continue to be with Brother Ed and his family, the members of this congregation and their families, and that when we depart from here today, that you will keep us under your watchful eye and under your protection. And that if it is your will, that you will allow us to return here on next Lord's Day. We pray the Lord that we will continue to live our lives according to your word and pleasing in your sight, that we will continue to find guidance and strength in your word. We pray that as Christians, that through our actions and deeds, that we can inspire others to seek you out. <clears throat> we pray the Lord that when our time here on earth comes to an end, that we have gained a place by your side in your kingdom of heaven. We pray that you will continue to bless the members of this congregation. And we know that if you hear, when you hear our prayer, that you hear our prayers, the Lord, and that if it is your will, it will be done. We thank you for the sacrifice made by your son and our savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the remission of our sins, which gives us that avenue, avenue of forgiveness. This prayer we say in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.